Okay, right this is Phil Simborg for the Backgammon Learning Center. And uh, tonight I've got a very interesting uh, video for you. Uh, I was in L.A. Uh, not long ago, and I go to L.A. often, maybe uh, eight or nine times a year, because uh, I've got L.A. And one night I was going to have a group lesson with eight of my students, and uh, Falafel was in town. And he said, what are you guys doing tonight? And I thought, wow, this would be cool. Why not, instead of just my having a group lesson with my students, let's have falafel come. And next thing I know, I hear from Joe Russell and Steve Sachs and Bob Wachtel. They're all looking for a game because whenever a fish like me is in town, they're always looking for action. So instead of having a lesson, I decided it would be really fun to have an interlocking shoe out. You can see here on the left, there's me in the box and falafels in the box. Steve Sachs volunteered to keep score because that was the hardest job of all. And we had about 15, 16 players, not all playing at the same time, but we often had 12 or 13 players playing at the same time. And the way an interlocking shoe at works is the guy in the box is against the other 12 players, and Falafel is in the box over here, and he's against the other 12 players. And at the same time, he's against me uh, and my shoe at. It goes back and forth, and there's lots and lots of action. You can imagine if you're playing for 10 bucks a point and you're in the box, against 13 players you're playing for 130 bucks a point when you're in the box and you're in the box about every six or seven games so it's really a fun action night we had a ball uh, we play non-consulting otherwise it would take forever to get a move done but everybody had their own cubes but it was while it was non-consulting it wasn't non-insulting there's lots of insults going on and lots of bets as a matter of fact Waffle gave me two to one odds on any time I wanted to bet him on a position or a play and he proved to me again why he's one of the best in the world because he beat me almost all the time and uh, I should learn my lesson and not bet against Falafel, but he took care of me. But we also learned something else. Everybody got to see these more complicated positions. We immediately put it into my computer, ran it through XG, and we all learned a lot. I walked away with about 20 positions. We've narrowed it down to uh, eight or nine positions that are the most interesting. And I've invited uh, two of the giants that were in the room with us that night to join us in this discussion, uh, Joe Russell and Steve Sachs. Uh, also in the game were Bob Wachtel and Falafel. I think these are four of the top 10 players in the world, in my opinion. We had a lot of other good players and a lot of students. We had a ball. It was a lot of fun. Nobody got hurt too much because uh, we kept the stakes reasonable. But we really did learn a lot from these positions. And today I'm going to share, along with uh, uh, the insights from Steve and Joe, uh, what we came across in these positions. So let's get right into it. Uh, and the first position we have is already on the screen. Now, if you're watching this video, after I put a position up, you can pause it, stop and think about what you would do, what your play would be or your cube action. And then, uh, then you can resume it and hear what Steve and Joe and I have to say about the position. So here's the, so here's the story. We're bearing off to the right every time. It's a money game. In this case, red is on roll. With XG, you can tell who's on roll by the color of the dice. And the question is cube action. Should red double? And if red doubles, would blue take or drop? Again, think about what you would do. Pause it if you need to. And then let's hear what uh, happened while we were playing. And let's get some insights from uh, Joe and Steve on this position. So. By now, you probably decided whether you would double and whether or not you would take or pass. Joe and Steve, it's all yours. Well, this, this in this position, many people would be reluctant to double because you're down 21 pips in the rice. And that's uh, pretty much and pretty much a guide to not double in most positions. But you have some very good shakes. Uh, that puts you in a commanding position, especially double six. As a matter of fact, I would, because of the Jacoby rule and the possibility of rolling double six alone makes this probably a double. You don't have that many anti-jokers, maybe five, four, five, two, or you're only really bad shakes. Your good shakes are double six, double three, six, three, double one, three, one, double four, all those shakes leave you would be market losers. If you knew you were going to roll any of those shakes, they would be market losers. Uh, that's a total of uh, one, two, four, five, seven, only like, like eight market losers as opposed to uh, four anti-jokers. But the... the if you were going by O'Hagan's law, you would say this is, would say, this is not a double. double. You have yeah. basically eight market-losing shakes, and you have four anti-jokers. But sometimes you have to look at the quality 
of the of the market loss and when you roll like double six or double double six your equity would be over two points and double three uh, your equity would be in the neighborhood of a point and a half and your your anti jokers only leave you as a small underdog it might be maybe like a quarter of a point underdog or something let me so, add something to, let me add something to this joke uh you i don't know that you counted it but if you just hit if you just roll a six any dances uh, I think that's going to be a pretty tough take, and that might be a market losing sequence as well. That would add to uh, you mentioned O'Hagan's law, where you have to net nine market losers uh, generally. But just think about a hit hitting a dance here. That would be pretty bad for blue. I'd be pretty scared Absolutely. to take it. Absolutely, that's that's a market loser. But I'm I'm talking. What I was referring to is the market losers just after your shake with him on roll. If you if you roll any of those eight numbers I mentioned with him on roll before he rolls you've lost your market. If, in other words, if you could decide to to double at, if he if you could double after you rolled you would have lost your market. He couldn't take before he rolled. So his law also takes into account if you just hit and he dances that's also adds to your market losing and that's why I think you're going to get way over nine market losers here. What about the take decision? Is it a take or pass? Oh, it's oh, it's, it's the, the decision is really uh, pretty, pretty clear cut, cut in, the, in that area. Yeah. It's uh, it's clear. It's the, the, the tough, tough decision is whether to double it because you, again, you've only got what, what would be eight market losers and four kind of mild anti jokers. So it's uh, and you're down 21 pips in the race. I mean, it's it's really just you know clear cut whether to take the only re the only reason you double this is because of the Jacoby rule because when you roll well like you hit with a six and he dances or you roll the double six double the super jokers you you, you have to collect on your gamuts if you don't collect on your gamuts in this position uh you know you're losing a lot when you roll well so you this is really a, a force double because of the Jacoby rule okay and what happened over the board is Bob Wachtel was in the box he doubled and everyone passed. It was a massive pass, uh, which was, as you can see, a very, very big error. And that's another reason you double these positions, because these positions are scary, and you might get a pass from a human being, even though it's a very big take. So everybody pretty much blew this on the take side. Now, in defense of yourself, Joe, and other people, you you may have been in the box on the other side and distracted. And I, in defense of myself, I may have seen uh, Joe Russell or, or, or Bob Glass or some really good player drop and just be a sheep and follow the crowd. Or we may have just read it wrong. We just may have just seen too little hope here. But there's plenty of hope here because even if you get hit, uh, all you have to do is anchor here and you have a hell of a game. And, of course, there are those roles where you don't get hit as well. Uh, Steve, anything to add to this position? Well, when I'm looking at this position, I'm looking at how the numbers play. And my tendency is, in a volatile position, is to group the numbers into four categories. Your great numbers, your good numbers, your fair numbers, and your poor numbers. And uh, it's easy enough to do this when you're at home and there's no you know, time pressure. You're playing in a social situation like this. It's not as easy. You just have to guesstimate. Uh, and because of the good diversity of numbers, you've got ones, fours, sixes, and threes to hit. you got to imagine that you have a fairly decent number of uh, good to great numbers here. Now, it's true you have some poor numbers, uh, and you are outboarded four to three, and you are down in the race. So that's definitely an argument for taking. And the fact that red doesn't have an active builder on the eight point makes it a much weaker position because the ace hits – lead to some counter hits that could cause blue to get uh, cause red to get gammon here. Uh -huh. uh, I agree with pretty much uh, everything that uh, even Joe said so far about this position. I definitely advocate the double uh, based on uh, the positional advantage. Uh, the take is easy because of the race. And uh, the human factor, of course, makes this a double because, you know, it's obviously some people might pass. And in this case, they all pass. Yeah, well, Steve, you raised a very good point. Over the board, we have to do these things quickly, and that's why everybody's live PR is going to be worse than if they're sitting at home and studying the position or playing online and have lots and lots of time uh, to go. But let me just show you one more thing that I do when I'm at home. Analyze, dice distribution. This shows you real graphically how many good rolls you have and how many bad rolls you have. Joe mentioned a 5-2 and a 5-4 are pretty lousy. A bunch of oh, other Phil, rolls. Phil, Phil, yeah. let me suggest that you click on click after on double take. take. That's it. 
click on after double take. See, see where it says four ply? You know where to do the four ply. Did you do this four ply? Right here. Click, okay. Click, okay. Now you can see after double take. Okay. Now if you look at if you look at it this way, you see after double six, it's worth about two and a half points. That yeah. Alone, that alone makes it. That alone, just the fact that it's worth that much after double six, and you can see you're doing okay in all the others except for maybe maybe like six or seven rolls, but you're doing okay with everything else. But after double six, you really basically can't afford, afford to roll double three, double six, or six three, three one, and having not double with the Jacoby rule. Great point. And, and this is the zero level. This is where it really it's 50-50. There's only two rolls where you're not a favorite after the roll, and that's part of O'Hagan's law, too. In addition to what loses your market, how are you the rest of the time? And when you roll mediocre, you're still in the 60-70 percentile, even in these bad rolls, of winning the game. This is, okay. this is, this is actually a situation where it would be O'Hagan. It doesn't quite fit O'Hagan's law because you only have like really eight jokers and you have four anti-jokers, but the quality of your jokers are so strong that you have you have to double to activate the gamuts because of the Jacoby rule. I got you. Uh, we're still getting a pretty bad echo. Steve, would you turn your... Okay. So we're going to go... That was position 20. 21. Okay. Here we go. Uh, thanks, guys. Here's the next position. Now, this is a checker play problem. Uh, red is holding a two cube. And red has five checkers off, as you can see. And blue is on roll with a 6-2. And the question is how to play 6-2. Again, uh, pause if you want to think about this a while. And then we'll show you what the right play is and uh, explain the play. I want to tell you right in front, I got this one very, very wrong. Fortunately, I didn't have to make the play. Falafel had to make this play, and uh, uh, I got it wrong. I had no idea what the right play here was. But... Uh, uh, by now, hopefully you've paused, you've come back, and you know how you're going to play a 6-2. And uh, Joe and Steve, what do you think? Well, this, these positions are very hard to win. A lot of times you are, your, your main concern in these positions is getting off the gamut. And you, your opponent already has five checkers off, and he has a crushed four-point four board. And you've got to try to contain the last checker, the 6-2. Uh, Falafel found a very good play here by by making the 13 point. He, he actually gives his opponent four three, which creates three blots, and he also gives him five two, which creates a second blot. After a four three, uh, I, after a four three, I think it's I think uh, blue is only about a half point underdog, and after a five two, maybe like a Less, it's worth less than a point. And I think with any other play, basically, uh, blue is probably worth more than a point. Uh, with any other, I'm, so, I mean, I'm sorry, red is probably worth more than a point with any other play. So, Falafel found a very, very good play here. Now, this again, this is because you're in this type of position. You're trying to save gamuts. If it was like a DMP in a match, this probably wouldn't be the best play. In that, in that case, probably playing 24-18 and in either 1816 or uh, 1917 would probably be a better play. And but, here you can see the actual numbers. If you're not familiar with XG, what Joe's saying is if you played 24-18-19-7, you win the game 12.9% of the time. Uh, and, and this game, uh, with 24-16, you win at 12%. With the right play, you only win at 11%. But the difference is you get gammon 12% with Falafel's play, and you'll get gammon 17%. With the uh, with the other plays that you would make at DMP. Yeah, I think you have so many. There's so many devastating jokers for red when when uh, when you come out uh, that that leave you gamut. If you look at the dice distribution, well, I'm not sure how many there are, but why don't we look at the dice distribution on this one? You want to look at you want to look at red's roll after the play. Right. So, uh, so we can make like say make the wrong play. No, yeah, make the wrong, make either of the wrong plays. Okay, let's let's uh, let's come out all the way with the with the six two to um, to here. Right. And now we put red on roll, and we go to analyze dice distribution, and uh, you can see a lot of a lot of red here. <laughs> and a lot of even the worst rolls for red are very very good, and he's got some huge huge jokers uh, that. 
put him up at the top. I, I think you have to you have to put after double take again, I believe. Phil, you, you, you have the wrong checker on the board. You're supposed to put a, a blue checker on the uh, 16 point. You have a blue checker born off here. Blue's still trying to get off the gammon. Okay, that's, that's correct. Uh, thank you. Analyze dice distribution. Here we okay, go. There we go. Okay, that's good. You don't have to click after double take. That, that takes care of it now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you see like after 5-5, five, 6-6, five, six, six, uh, six, four, four, three, five, two, six, one, all double fours, all these are like worth 1.2 to 1.6. And e e any other shake is still worth about a point. So uh -huh. you can't, there's nothing, you're, the, the, even after uh, any other shake, red is still worth a point. And after the jokers, he's, you know, he's worth an average of 1.3 or so, 1.3 something. Let's so, look at the distribution <laughs> after falafels play and see what it looks like now. Uh, six yeah. and two. All right. And now we go to dice distribution. So just, there's not what what you see is the the jokers don't play nearly as well. I, the jokers are now only worth about one one average maybe one point one five or one point one or something. But what you have the huge swing is on the four three it's now only worth half a point, and on the five two it's worth like nine tenths of a point. Uh -huh. so, so there's a huge, huge gain on the four three, and there's a there's a gain against the, you gain maybe two tenths of a point on when he rolls what would have been a joker in the other position, and everything okay, that, else kind of washes uh, out. I can't tell you how often. Are we I, looking at the six two for red here? Or are we looking? At no, we're looking at any roll action on roll. Just any any random roll for red. Didn't matter what. Okay. Now I can't tell you how often when I'm playing. I'm sorry. Uh, Steve, we are cutting out. Okay, I'm here. Okay, I hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah, so my question was, uh, yeah, so my question was uh, do you have to hit the cube tab to get uh, your equities, or are we just looking at the move? Because what I see is I see a 3-1, you know, or there was a 6 Yeah. Doesn't so matter. if you hit the cube tab on the low... No, when you when you do the lower left. when you do use dice distribution, it doesn't matter what hap what the what the number happens to be on the on the dice, it because okay. it goes through all of the numbers that you could possibly roll. It's random. So, That's so fine. This, this has no effect. Uh, what I was going to say though is I can't tell you how often I'd be playing. Uh, and one thing I've learned by watching and playing with really top players and with the Giants, They'll sit there and they'll look, oh, I think I'll make this play because if he rolls a 4-3, he's dead. Or I'll make this play because if he rolls a 5-6, I got him. And they, they're looking, they're such optimists. They're looking for the one or two bad rolls that can kill them because the rest of the rolls don't matter anyway. Because if they don't roll this really bad roll, they're dead anyway. So you may as well find some way to win this game. Find some way that can you can really hurt your opponent. Uh, and they're always looking for that number. And they always see that number. And uh, that's... That's something about backgammon where you, where you, even in a hopeless situation like this, or a seemingly hopeless situation, you look for the one or two ways where you could really hurt your opponent. And, of course, as Joe pointed out, this play also cuts down on the gammons quite a bit. It's a play that I never would have found over the board. I would have played uh, the second best play, which was 13 to, to uh, uh, 13 into the five point and just tried to get the most shots that I could. And I probably would have gotten gammoned a lot more, obviously, about five or six percent more. Okay. Any other points on this one? We'll move on. Well, the big swing is on the sevens because you, you you turn what would be a very good roll for red uh, into a poor roll. Now, even if he rolls only a six one, where he doesn't have to leave an extra shot, there's just, just a massive swing on all the sevens. Uh huh. So that again, that's my point. Steve is seeing, and Falafel saw that there's a, a, a way to really capitalize if he rolls that one number. Now, what if he doesn't? Most of the time, he's not going to roll the seven. Most of the time, he's going to roll something else. But with, when he rolls something else, it really didn't matter anyway. Give yourself a shot. Give yourself a chance to really gain if everything else looks bad anyway. That, that's, that's the key to the position. When he rolls something else, it really doesn't matter that much. But when he rolls that, it matters a lot. Yeah, you're giving yourself some edge. And those little edges, okay, so what if you pick up 3 or 5% on that play? Most people say, so what, I only gained 3 or 5%. If you do it on every play throughout the game and you only pick up 3 or 5%, before you know it, you've picked up 40%.
because you do you're doing it a lots of plays. You can't think about how much did you gain on just that one play. You have to look at maximizing your odds on every play, and that's going to be the difference between uh, winning and losing. By the way, in the Chouette, it worked out very well. Steve kept score, so he didn't get a chance to win. But the other Giants were all winners. Bob Wachtel and Joe Russell and Falafel were all winners. And uh, they're proving that uh, there is some skill to this game. They were the best players in the game, and they and they walked away with the most. The rest of us didn't mind because we learned a lot, and it was fun. And a couple of us, including me, won a little bit, too. Okay, let's go to the next position. How about position 15? 15? Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we have blue on roll. Cube action, blue is on the bar, and the question is, should blue double? And if blue double, should red take or pass? Again, give it some thought, pause the video, and then let's see what uh, happened and find out from Joe and Steve what should happen. <clears throat> okay, blue is on roll. Joe and Steve, let me show you the answer. What happened is that everybody dropped, but... Bob Wachtel and Falafel, and one of the other players, one of my students uh, took, and uh, but everybody else passed, and it's a huge, huge take, and barely a double. What's going on here, guys? <clears throat> well, well, yeah, yeah. Blue, blue on shake. shake. This is a, this is close, a call close, is close call is because blue on shake has eight, eight devastating market losers. losers. Five, 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 three, three, four, three, five, three, three, four, three, five, two, three, two. Three, two. Uh, but he also has nine devastating fans. So in this case, he has eight joke, eight jokers and nine anti-jokers. But again, it's the quality versus quantity situation. The quality of those eight market losers is devastating. It's just like uh, it's most of those numbers, he hits two men and, he, and he's lost his market by a mile. I'm, I haven't looked at dice distribution, but if you look at the dice distribution, I'm sure on those shakes, he's going to be worth uh, massive amounts after double take. Yeah. So those eight shakes, he's worth he's worth a point one point three or something like that. And if you look at his bad shakes, those he has nine dancing numbers. The nine dancing numbers, he's worth like minus half a point. So again, it's a Jacoby rule situation. situation. If it wasn't, it wasn't for the Jacoby rule, rule, you wouldn't you wouldn't double, double this. If this were a, if you were playing a match, you, playing a match, you wouldn't have to double because you could win gamuts. You could win gamuts without doubling here. So if if you made this a match score, I doubt if this if you would. Well, let me just unclick Jacoby, and run it again real quick, and you'll see that it's right on the edge, very very close. Okay, so so this is a I'm sure in a match situation you wouldn't double this. This is just this is just main, or it's an optional situation. But Jaco situation. Jacoby makes it a forced double, as you can see, and even then, it's it's very close. Without Jacoby, that with Jacoby, right on the edge, it becomes a, just a bare double. So Why did I think everybody drop this if it's such a bare, bare double. What 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 was going through our head? Well, I was one you know, of the I'm not exactly. Sure. You, you have to realize have in this shoot that there were some US strange US actions US on the cubes because sometimes you had a world class player playing against someone that wasn't quite world class, and it could have been this situation. Although this is probably plays itself enough that well, I don't, I don't know. Red has a tricky position sometimes. Yeah. So. I'm, I, I, can't I can't exactly, exactly tell you why. why. It, it certainly, certainly looks like I would clearly take this, this. And if I passed, it might have been because I was scared of uh, who was playing who. Think about this echo, Steve, please. Okay, so your point is, uh, and this is something that we've learned in the books from way back, highly volatile positions that have huge swings, you have to double because you, if you do lose your market, you, you just lose by too much. So, so if you double and you dance, you're very unhappy. But you're a lot happier when you when you hit compared to how unhappy you are when you dance. And when you dance, this game's not over. So uh, the more volatile the position is, the more you've got to turn that cube. But uh, why do we all pass? This just looks like such an ugly position for Red to play. He's got three checkers stacked on the three-point, but the glass is not just half empty. Blue's got the two-point made, which is a real negative for Blue's position, and is another reason why it's exciting to take this cube. If this two-point were up higher, his five or four-point, this would be a very scary take. Then, then, then you get a, you have a much stronger position for Blue. Steve, well, why, anything why, to add? Why don't you uh, 
give give blue the four point and show everyone what the difference would be it's now it becomes still a solid take but far from the huge take it was and it right. becomes a very big double right and the five point which should make it even a little bit better for blue probably makes it a pass now i would guess well let's see yeah look at that it became a huge pass from a blunder to, to pass the difference between the five point and the four point if there ever was a a good illustration of the importance of the five point this is it steve anything to add Yeah, uh, when Joe and I were discussing this position, uh, I didn't think it was a cube, and he thought it was a cube, and his reasons were the strong market losers that uh, uh, really enhance uh, Blue's chances to win and win a gammon. I, I thought it was very easy take and, and not a cube because I thought most of the time, uh, first of all, if Blue doesn't come in, it's, it's not good for Blue at all. And even if he does come in and just hits one checker, you know, Blue's far from... Uh, finishing uh, red off here red has got a couple of anchors you know one on the outside one on the inside and blue has a lot of uh development needs these needs to uh institute here uh -huh. but this also illustrates another very important point and this is one of my very very favorite strongest strategies in backgammon is to use Wolsey's law and if you use Wolsey's law, can you be sure that everyone's taking this? Well, if you're Steve Sachs, yeah, you're sure, because he's used to playing against the computer and other giants, and he knows they're taking. But when you're in a chouette, uh, and when you're in a money game, and there's money on the line, and this looks very scary, this certainly is a reasonable chance that you're going to get some passes. So for no other reason than that, it's right to cube. And this time, it certainly proved right. You got about nine or nine or ten passes in this position. And uh, if you don't turn the cube, there's no way you're going to give your opponent a chance to make a mistake. So you should be a little bit more on highly volatile and scary positions. You should be much more ready to give the cube, even if you're not sure it's a cube. Okay, next one. Should I go to number, 14. go to the top of the list? Let's go to 14. 14, okay. I hope you're keeping track of what we're doing here because yeah, I've, I've lost track. Okay, number 14. Uh, this is a, a red on roll. Cube action problem again. Should red double? And if red double, should blue take or pass? Give it a little thought. See what you would do. And let's uh, take a look at the answer. And let's see what happens. Okay. Someone didn't double here. It's a highly volatile cube. And uh, this wasn't even a cube. Uh, I assume it was the player in the box that didn't double. Uh, Joe, you want to? Or Steve, what do you think about this? Okay. Well, this position you have uh, eight double hits where your equity is probably over two points I would think when you double hit you're you're probably over two points 11 single hits prob 11 single hits where you're probably worth a point and a half or more you got that's 19 extreme market losers and uh, you have nine anti jokers again uh, which uh, which is uh, negative but the question here is I don't know how anyone could could not double this maybe the person in the box was playing to get the box I have no idea maybe they misunderstood the position I don't know if people know in an interlocking chouette to to get the box you have to beat the captain sometimes people will be a little conservative when I mean to get the box you have to beat the captain has to beat the box so maybe the captain did not double this because he wanted to ensure that he got the box I'm not exactly sure what the story was but the well, I'll give, is... you, I'll give you a story, Joe. In my chouette, there are players that won't double this because they're up on the sheet and it's getting towards the end of the night and they don't want to take a chance on losing a whole bunch of points in one game. So they're doubling or not, depending on how they've done the games before this and whether they're plus or minus on the sheet. And that affects both their cube uh, giving and taking decisions, which, as we all know, is going to cost you money every time if you if you look at the sheet to decide whether you should be doubling or taking. And that may have been the case here as well. Uh, yeah, the question I, the question in this position is, is it a take or not? And this is a scary position to take because you can see on the double hits, it's probably worth over two points. And on the single hits, it's probably worth over a point and a half. And that's you're talking about a combination of a total of 19 uh, hits. So it's pretty scary position. Uh, the take is 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 real, real scary. I guess you, you know, it's a this one. This is a tough one to not to figure out quickly over the board whether to take or not this is a tough position i guess because of the nine fans 
the ace five and the deuce five also don't play that well i guess because of those numbers you can you you know you can take and worst case scenario you do have a, a deuce point game you've got uh -huh. a, a 23 point uh 23 point game in a worst case scenario but it's, it's a de you have so many devastating roles uh for red, well, but uh, let's, it's, it's, let's it's a look tough at how position. exciting this is to be blue if red dances, which happens 25% of the time. He doesn't come in. He rolls combinations of three, five, and six. 25% of the time, let's pretend that that uh, blue red doubles, blue takes the cube, and red dances, and now blue's on roll. Let's take a look at what blue's equity is in this position. Uh, he's now a 60% favorite, holding the cube on roll, winning a lot more gamins than his opponent. That's why this is a take. I think that that's the biggest part of it. Now, you have to be an optimist to think that red is going to dance, but it does happen 25% of the time. And, of course, there are times when you get the double hit and you immediately roll a two and hit back or make this anchor. So blue's got some game here, but it is scary. I agree with you. Steve, anything to add? Yeah. Um, one thing that makes it such a strong double is that not only uh, – are you just uh, destroying your opponent when you double hit or, or hit king, single hit and he doesn't hit back? But when he dances, uh, it's actually not even a recube, as you've just shown. And your equity is even increased even more than the math says, because some of your opponents are just going to make a mistake and redouble. One of the main reasons it's not a redouble is that uh, for Blue to have six checkers on his three-point is pretty unproductive. Uh, not, not only does he have the bad numbers that... Uh, like five three and even double sixes comes out and leaves a shot he's got quite a few bad numbers but even when he does roll uh, a number that uh, that covers he's in jeopardy of getting counterattack so the only really good numbers after uh, red fans here is when uh, blue comes out and covers which is happens less often than you would think uh -huh. he's got to roll a five or a six in combination with the one two or four to come out and cover and that's not that many rolls Right. Uh huh. Good point. Okay, let's move on. What, what, which one next, Joe? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. Okay, we've got blue on roll, and again, you can tell by the color of the dice. Blue on roll, cube action. Uh, should blue double, and if blue double, should red take or pass? Um, okay. Again, pause it. Give it some thought. Come back and let's see what's right and what happened. Okay, this is not a double by quite a bit and a very easy take. What happened uh, in the game? Okay, this is a situation where uh, Bob Wattell and I took two to one from one of the world's top players. Uh, that He doubled and we said that we didn't think it was a double and he was so confident of his double that he gave us two to one odds and fortunately we were right this time. Uh -huh. uh, the reason that it's not a double is because you have very, very few market losers. Uh, you really want these kind of positions. You really want to like have cleared that ten point and have men like on your seven and eight, you know, six, seven, and eight, especially. And you don't want to have too many men on your seven and eight. You really want to have like those men on the ten point, on the six point, or at least put them on the on the six and seven or something before you really have what I would call to be a market loser. Uh, he Let's doesn't have that. Let's take those checkers and put it there. That this is like probably borderline. Yeah, this is yeah. like a, a small. This is a tiny market loss, and that's a great check. You know, after uh -huh. a great check, he's got a tiny market loss. I think the only thing he probably has a really big market loss on is maybe double twos. Put it there now; it's probably a big market loss. Yeah. yeah. So, if you even if you put if you put him on the seven and eight, I mean six and seven, the six and seven. This is probably one point one or something like that. I would guess one point two maybe. At one point two, okay. So, so your market law, your market losers here are, you know, like double twos, four three. Try a four two. See what a four two looks like. Yeah. So, so the, these, these, these. Let's, let's let's hold on a second. You have to give red a number to play. So, Lou's going to roll a four two, and then red has to roll something. So, give him a five one, for example, and then and then have. Uh, Blue beyond play. Well, five one. Well, something he would that you think is an average. With the five. He probably come out with the five and yeah, split. Right. That's, That's right. fine. 
it's still going to be a pass. Yeah, but see, that's not it's not like a huge market loss. It's like 1.06. So basically what you have is, and, and look at the 4.3 again after that sequence. Try the 4.3, so, Yeah, there and there, and now 5.1. This is where I said it was maybe like 1.1 or so, 1.15 maybe. 1.16, okay. 1.17 actually. So these these things are, he doesn't have that many good checks. He's got like 2-2, two, 4-3, two, four, uh, four, and those most of those except for 2-2, two, two, dog is double fours also, but double fours isn't as good as, uh, as, as double twos. Most of these things except for double twos lose the market by a small margin. And the, the converse of that is he has some real anti-jokers. Double three is uh, is an anti-joker. Double six is a huge anti-joker. Actually, probably makes red the favorite after double six. Uh, we'll look at dice distribution. Let's see. Yeah, double. Yeah, wow. Red is yeah. Red is a half point favorite after double six. Uh huh. So, so uh, you really, if you look at if you look at the, the distribution. The, after double take, the only thing this shows like the only big loss, only big market losses after double two, and it says it has it at what like 1.15 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but you look at what so so you have like some very small losses on your best numbers. <laughs> look what you're losing, like you're losing hugely on double six. You're going from uh, 0.4 to minus a half a point, and. Few, there are a few other sh there are a few other shakes that make you bad. So this is just too early double. In general, you want to clear the clear the ten point when you get these men on the six, seven, and eight. You can double, but even then, uh, sometimes you'll have a take, and sometimes it'll be a small pass. So well, this was here's just a, here's a good summation about these kinds of positions. When your opponent has a back game or a double holding game, I don't call this a back game. I call this a double holding game when it's this high. It's not always a bad thing to lose your market. We've been trained so much to not lose your market. But in these kinds of games, you often should lose your market because if you double before you lose your market, you're taking way too big a risk. If if blue, blue doesn't clear this point after doubling and then ends up rolling some numbers where he can't clear this point and he starts crashing these numbers, then you hit run into all kinds of numbers that are going to be horrible for you later that even after you clear this point, when these things, when these points get stripped, you're very likely to leave shots even later, even if you did get lucky and clear this point. So in these kinds of positions, uh, one, you don't want to lose your market in a racing game. But in this kind of a game, losing your market is not a terrible thing, especially, as Joe says, if you're only losing it by a little bit when you lose it. Well, if indeed this, uh, this is a double and it's not, you, you you definitely wouldn't want to avoid doubling just for the fear of uh, increasing the volatility and the risk. Because if the position's a double, a double, it's a double. Take the two checkers on the 10 point, put them on the 9, and see what, see what happens then. This would, this would have to be double. Even though you have the same issues of, uh, oh, it's a pretty close call. It's close, yeah. I would think you would want to double this position, although this is a vast difference from the initial position because uh, the 6 is playing much better here. Uh, going back to the original position, uh, you know, with respect to Woolsey's Law, I don't think that you're going to get too many people that are going to drop this position. I mean, it's possible that you want to double a position that's a no-double if you think you're going to get some drops. But this, this doesn't, you know, only the most unseasoned players really probably would want to drop a position like this. So you're not going to gain the bluff value out of doubling here. Yeah, this is a very simple reference position. You should know that when your opponent gets to this position, you have a pass. It's that simple. When he's here, you have a pass. And at any time he's before he gets to this position, as long as you have reasonable timing to have a, to make a good board, you've got to take. It's that simple. So the take decision, it, it's just such a simple reference that it's not something you should miss very often. Okay, next one. What, before you move on, just, sure. just also show, show them the importance of those the, that distribution. Take, uh, take, two, t t put two men, put two men on the uh, nine, on the eight point, the two spares on the ten, the two men on the ten on the eight, and then and then and then give give red the five one for example. Okay, now look at this position. Well, not dice distribution. I mean, look at the. 
Oh, look at the cube action? Yeah, look at the cube action. By the way, I'm hitting plus plus, which is the best evaluation you can get other than doing a rollout. And it's usually pretty good, pretty accurate. You don't always have to do rollouts. Okay, so you see, you see this, this position is a clear-cut take. So that distribution, look at the difference between this. This is 8.48, and if you were to move those two guys to the uh, six-point, becomes a massive pass, right? Like 1.15 or something. Oh, yeah. 1. 1.238, yeah. So the distribution is so critical here. You When you... What you really want to, this is, you know, you really want to get to a position where you have cleared that point and you, and you can avoid awkward sequences on the bear end. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, next, uh, next one. Which one should I go to, Joe? Uh, let's see. I lost track of where we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can keep up. Hold on. Okay. Seven, 13. I think ne next position, uh, 12, and I'm going to let Steve take this one. Okay. Position number 12 is a, uh, uh, let me just cross off what happened here. Okay, this is red on roll cube action. Should red double? And if red double, should blue take her pass? Uh, give it a little thought. <clears throat> and I'll bring up the answer and we'll let Steve ha tackle this one. Uh, let me just think about this myself. I don't remember this one. Let's see, red on roll. I sure know what I would do. Let's take a look at the answer. Okay, uh, split the field with this double in the box by, so Bob Wachtel doubled this and uh, a bunch of players took and a bunch of players passed and it's a clear take. Steve? I remember uh, watching this game and uh, Falafel was one of the ones who take and I told him uh, either right after he took or some point in time during or after the game, I said, I agreed with your take there. I mean, Red has three checkers back and although he has a fairly dominating position in that he's got uh, blue semi primed in with the prospect of fully priming him in. Uh, you know, red, red, red still has a lot of work to do. Red is stripped on his eight point. He's stripped on his midpoint. So even if he uses one of those numbers to make the the seven point or the five point, blue's got some counterplay. Um, and even if uh, even if red rolls a really fine number like uh, a six five, you know, blue still has counterplay. He could roll. A six five himself or double ace, double deuce, four two, four three, etc. etc. Um so I definitely advocate a cube here. The cube is to me was clear. Um, not only be, because well first of all, even thinking that it's a take you might get some drops. Uh but secondly, um, because you know, as I stated that uh, Red had the three checkers back that uh in the race is uh race isn't too bad that blue's got plenty of counterplay and you know worse comes to worse he's got an ace point game or more than likely a deuce point game. So I find this to be a take. Uh huh. I think there's another reason that this also would be a take. I'm willing to bet you, uh, aside from Giants, uh, you take the average player, intermediate or low open player, Red's got a lot of tough plays to make here, and Blue's plays, at least for the next few rolls, are going to be fairly automatic. There's a lot of rolls here where uh, uh, this roll and the next roll, I'm not sure myself how I would play how I would play the checkers. Uh, do you hit with a loose six, for example? If you roll the, for example, if you roll the six-two, are you hitting off the two-point? Uh, are you running this checker to safety? What are you doing? Uh, how do you play this game? There's a lot of rolls here that are tricky, uh, that are duplicated. If you roll a four-three, are you hitting or are you making your bar point? Uh, there's just a lot of plays I think that lots of people would have problems with, and so the difficulty of play here is clearly against red. Joe, anything to add? Uh, not much. I think you guys pretty much covered that position. It's you're you're doing so well. Uh, you've got the double shots. And you've got, you know you got three men back. It's it's clear cut. Very strong double. The question is the take. But from the other side, you know these are positions that are, look scary to uh, intermediates. But you know you see that you have you have worst case scenario you have a 24 point game you have an excellent chance to make a second anchor when you get missed you're doing great these are just the kind of standard positions that come up where they're you know doubles and you just have to you know grit it and take and and uh yeah you i like to i like to look at most common variations let's assume that red hits blue here i just want to take this one step further let's assume that he rolls something and hits blue and now blue rolls a two something he's got a game here let's give sure. blue the cube 
He's got a one-two uh, game that that isn't horribly, horribly timed. That could could be a reasonable game. Let's give him a let's give him a a, a two something, a two two four, just anything that makes this point. And you put blue on roll, and let's see what blue's equity is. He's got thirty-seven percent winning chances here. Uh, I got a checker. I got a checker on the bar. I'm sorry. Blue uh, blue checker on the uh, yeah, like that. Yeah. So he's got he's got thirty three percent winning chances here. He's got he still has game uh, if he just rolls a two. And of course, he could also have rolled a five four or five three and have a hell of a game even after he gets hit here. You know, I, I, he, he's probably not even doing that terribly. I mean, he's not doing well, but he's probably got some chances after like a five one even. Look at a five one where he comes in and and hits on the twenty point. Yeah, he's still got thirty five percent there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so it's even. He doesn't even have to anchor. He just has to come. You know, has to roll something. And don't forget, he has like five five and five six that, that would have hit in the outfield. Five five would have been a hell of a shot. You know, five five would have picked would have hit two checkers in this position. Five six hits the man outfield. So he's got a lot of counterplay here. It's just it's, it's not like you get hit. It's not like people look at oh I get hit I'm going to be gammon. It's so far from that. Yeah, yeah. He only gets gammoned about thirty percent after this play and. Uh, He's got some real good counterplay, especially if he can end up making the five point or end up making the even the one two back game. Uh, he should be able. He has a reasonable chance to time this game. Although the one two back game is one of the hardest to time. When you do, it sure is fun. That's my favorite game to play. <laughs> okay, next position. Uh, what nine. number? Number, number nine. nine. Okay. Number nine. We have a uh, another cube action. You know, you'll notice that many of these are cube action because that's where the big swings are in a shoe ed. Uh, it's just as important to play the checkers well, but this is where lots of uh, lots of money changes hands when you get the cube right or wrong. Blue is on roll, cube action. Uh, red's got uh, two checkers in the air, and blue is on roll. Should blue double, and if blue doubles, should red take or pass? Well, let's take a look at the answer. Again, you can pause this if you need more time. And the answer is tiny, tiny, tiny take, just on the edge after rolled out. And I thought this was a monster pass. I have to tell you, I would never have taken this cube. Uh, I thought it was a real easy double. Steve, you want to take this? Well, I definitely thought this was a cube because uh, using the Jacoby rule, you lose your market by so much when you come out with a six. And not only do you have uh, good rolls that contain a six, you have good rolls that contain ones, twos, and, and fours. So you have a good diversification of numbers that uh, really play in your favor. Even a number as kind of weak as 5-4 still makes the deuce point. So you have to double uh, based on the fact of, of the race lead, gammon prospects, you have them outboarded, uh, and just the good diversification numbers that you have. Uh, I did think it was a take, though, uh, for only the main reason of the fact that Blue has their ace point made. If Blue had their deuce point made and not the ace point, I think it would be a very, very clear pass because... Uh, blue can only win by uh, well blue cannot prime red in unless he closes them out but if uh, blue has the deuce point instead of the ace point then he can either win by closing his opponent out or by priming him in I, I know why I took a picture of this because somebody took this in the chouette and I was sh I was shocked I didn't think it was close and I couldn't believe that somebody actually took this and I don't remember who but and I don't remember what the result was, but that's what shocked me. I thought this was a monster pass. I never well, even dreamed that this was a take. Well, it's still it's still two men. You know, you still have two men stuck behind a five prime. And the problem, the reason these positions become close, this one's like borderline. But the reason these positions are close is because what blue has to do is to attack, uh, escape, and contain, and. If red were to, if red comes, let's say blue rolls something average that doesn't escape or make a point, then if red comes in with one man, blue has to attack. And if red ever hits that man back, now it's three men behind a prime, and it's and it's like the game is already starting to swing. So the problem with these type positions is you have to attack and contain simultaneously. And when you only have 11 numbers to escape and two men behind a five prime. One time you ever get hit back, the game is you know starts to swing right away. So you're an underdog. So it. it's uh, that's the problem. And Steve made a very good point. If if you'd had 
if you look at this, if the guy has the two point instead of the ace point, now you have two ways to win. Now you don't necessarily, the difference here is now you don't necessarily <coughs> have to attack. Because you see that it, it's worth 0.15. That's a huge difference. It's got like the same thing as that other position we looked at when we moved from the four point to the five point. Strengthening your position here means you may be able to win without attacking. You here escaping alone may be enough. You may not have to contend. The guy may come in on the ace point. He may get himself stuck behind a prime, and uh -huh. he may not be able to escape. So this it's a huge difference. So the the, the take the the borderline decision here comes because of the fact that you have to escape and contain. Uh, when you don't have to contain, then it becomes an easy decision like this. Here, you don't necessarily have to contain, so it becomes a much easier decision. And I, I hope everybody notices what, what Joe and Steve have done a lot in a lot of these positions. They don't just look at the position. They say, how can you change the position to make it into a pass or make it into a take? Look at the difference of whether or not blue has the two-point made versus the one-point made. It's huge. And this gives you terrific insight when you're playing the game earlier in the game when you're deciding which point to make or how strong your position is to realize how much worse it is for a red to have the one point open as opposed to the two point open. Because if, if Red can make the two point or come in on the two point, he has opportunities to escape and he has more opportunities to get shot and he uh, to get shots and he gets gammoned a lot less. So unless you make these kinds of shifts, you really don't learn the, the nuances of the differences in these two kinds of positions. So these variations is the is the way you really learn this game and you really hone your skills. Anything else about this position, guys? Okay, again, I was shocked. I thought it was such a huge double. I would have given, I mean, such a huge pass. I would have given big odds uh, that it was to pass, and I was wrong, and I've learned something. Okay, next one. Number, are we down to seven now? Seven, yeah. All right. Uh, this is a uh, checker play problem. Uh, blue to play 5-1. Red's holding the cube, and uh, blue has uh, got to play a 5-1 from here. And the question is, how would you play a 5-1? Uh, by the way, you have the benefit of knowing the race. Before the roll, uh, blue is losing by six pips, so the race is dead even after the uh, after the roll. Of course, there's a lot of wastage here by, by red and a little bit of wastage by blue. But how do you play the 5-1? Do you bring it closer? Do you clear the point? Do you play all inside? Those are your three options. Let's see what what's going on here, what the answer is. And... The right play is to stay back and wait for the shot and clear the seven point uh, as opposed to the second best play, which would actually be leaving a blot uh, at this point, which is something that didn't occur to me. I was really looking at just about everything but that. So, Joe, Steve? Well, this is a position where uh, Bob Wattell and I thought it was right to make the two point. I actually even made a bet with Falafel that it was right to make the two point. Uh, I thought with his crushed three-point board uh, and the fact that if he, you know, he rolls anything without a three in it, basically he's going to have to come out and expose that second blot, uh, and, and you'll have threes and twos to hit inside and something to hit outside, and you'll have some gammon equity. But uh, it turns out that uh, Falafel showed that he's the master he is. He was right about this. It's that uh, Blue has... You know, a very a very strong position, just playing it safe, waiting for this guy, waiting for Red to come out. He's going to get shots. He's going to get uh, shots at the block that comes out. He doesn't have to worry about the three. With Red owning the cube, and a three is just a devastating roll for Blue. That's that's the big swing. With Red owning the cube, and Red Red up rolls a three, Blue is just in in very poor shape. So Falafel was was right about this position. I even I actually looked at this position uh, at other scores and it and it, it, it like scores in a match uh, and found that even I think even at four away two away or something this was like my play was was like a pick 'em or something. So I was wrong about this. I wanted to flexibility to have the commanding position, but the three is just too devastating. Falafel was right, and congratulations to him on being right, and that's why he is the master he is. Okay, so if we had made your play, here's what it looks like. What you're saying is you're giving him 11 numbers that can really hurt you quite a bit and swing this game quite a bit. And by making Falafel's play, only a 6-5 is the hitting number. And, look, and that, 
let's look at the dice distribution after the two plays. After the two plays? Yeah. Well, you know, there's a way to do that without actually making both plays. Let me show you how we can do that. We can highlight both plays, right click, and go to dice distribution. Oh, fantastic. And it, and it shows you uh, it shows you what it looks like from the from the rollers from blue's perspective after each play. And you can see that if you made the second best play where you leave the three shot, uh, if you get hit with uh, a, a three, where are the three rolls here, that hurts you tremendously on quite a few rolls. Here, the threes aren't so bad for you uh, because right. they don't hit. So you can right. see the difference in dice distribution. Yeah, and it's, it, it, even if you look at the, at the good rolls, there's not that big a difference. Uh, you don't gain that much from my play even on the good rolls, which, is, which was surprising to me. Uh, I, thought, I thought when he rolled a non-three, you would gain quite a bit from my play, but from looking at the dice distribution, you don't gain that much because uh, with his plays, they're ver it, they're varying from like 0.4 to 0.8. With mine, they're varying from 0.5 to 0.8. So it's not that much of a gain, but it's a huge loss on those threes. Yeah. By the way, double six and double five, you ignore those because regardless of which play you make, you're destroyed right. or you're hurt a lot with those rolls. So only look at the rolls that matter. And if you leave them the three, you've got all these rolls with a three in it where you get hurt quite a bit. And you ha don't have that many rolls where you get hurt quite a bit when you don't have a three. The double four, you still get hurt the same with either play. And uh, the only difference is with the other, with the first play, you're leaving them a six five which also hurts you. So this dice distribution, again, you can't do this over the board, but this is why you can check your thinking to see if you really did notice everything and, and realize, as Joe said, how big a difference it made. He thought it made a much bigger difference than it made uh, when you don't get hit by making the two point. Making the two point doesn't seem to be that big a difference. The real difference is, are you gonna hit him when he comes out and are you gonna be able to bring the race home? So it isn't about making the two point really that, that much. I would be curious to, to look at a couple of positions and see what would have made my play right. For example, if the guy, if you get, if you give the guy the two point board instead of the three point board, does that swing it? Yes, it's very close now. Yeah. Okay. And let's give it, keep him with the three point board. And uh, this probably doesn't swing it, but let's say. Put the checker on the uh, 15 point, like on the 17 point, and see if that could swing it. Make it, yeah, I doubt if that swings it. Well, it gives you another play without oh, yeah, leaving the direction. Yeah, I, yeah I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think of it. Make it on this, put it on the, uh, well, I guess, yeah, I guess, you, I guess it's going to give you another play with any of those sequences. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the, 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 probably the borderline position was if he had the two point board, it would be, this would be slightly right. That's probably the reference position and something uh -huh. like this. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's about a wash with a two point board because, and again, the reason uh, why is because when you get hit with the three, it's less devastating. You're more likely to come in. You don't dance 25% of the time. You only dance with uh with with four numbers with double one double two and two one so you're going to pop right back in just about all the time if you do get hit okay i think we're on the last one now aren't we i just wanted to say something before we move on to the last position that uh, i actually agreed with joe and bob wachtel on their choice of uh, making the deuce point uh and i'm going to echo joe's sentiment that falafel's a fantastic player he's been my vote for giant number one on quite a few occasions. Uh, the only drawback for that is, is that he's got to be right two out of three times just to break even. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the day that we had this interlocking shoe at, I spent the entire day with Falafel uh, giving a private lesson, and we had lots of positions come up, and he consistently gave me two-to-one odds anytime we disagreed on a play, and he killed me. He slaughtered me. I mean, it's not saying much that Falafel's better than me, uh, but here's a situation where he he was better than than two of the best players in the world, and the three of the best players in the world, Sachs, Russell, and Wachtell, like the other play. And it's not unusual. Falafel really is is that good. There's no question about it. It's, and even when he's in the, he he still stands out in the crowd of other giants. He's just a great, great player. Uh, he isn't ranked uh, number one uh, because number one because. First, first of all, Mochi's been doing so great lately, and, and so is uh, Michi. And also, Falafel hasn't been playing in that many tournaments lately. So we hope he returns. Okay, last position, I believe. 
Uh, number six. Uh, here again, we have a cube action problem. Blue is on roll, and uh, should blue double? And actually, it's a redouble here. Blue's holding the cube. Uh, should he redouble? And if he does redouble, should red take or pass? Go ahead, uh, this one I had no problem with uh, because I've got a pretty good reference here, as I think most players do. Let's take a look at the answer. And it is a redouble and a pass, but a very, very small pass. It's close. Joe, Steve? Yeah. Um, I think a couple of years ago I might have just dropped this like automatically. It's like, well, I've only got three checkers off. I know I need to have five checkers off to have a borderline take, but... You know, you haven't. Uh, Blue hasn't closed their board yet. Uh, they have a Blue has a few bad numbers that don't cover at all. And when Blue doesn't cover and Red comes in and hits, uh, Blue's gonna Red's gonna have a pretty good uh, chance to win the game owning the cube. Um, however, you have to double this position because anytime you cover, even if uh, Red comes in on the ace point, it's probably gonna be either uh, double pass or extremely close. Yeah. So just. Uh, Give them a one five and then put the blue on roll here. I think it's pretty. I think it's a redouble take, but it's uh, close. I don't know. Oh, okay. So, but uh, even so, um, that it's only a marginal non redouble, and that might change with the rollout. It still sh uh, shows that you you weren't you didn't make a mistake in uh, not redouble in redoubling in the first place. Because even if they came in, it would still be uh, reasonable to have cubed. Uh huh. Now, you mentioned a reference position that even if you had five checkers off, and that's, that's why these reference positions are critical. We need to know that with a perfect bear off and one checker on the roof and five checkers off, you have a bear take. Let's take a look. You have a bear take. That's a reference position. That I just know that. So that's, that is going to help you get to... Uh, interpolating what to do when you have three checkers off, four checkers off, six checkers off, and so on. So with three checkers off, you know once you close the board, and he didn't have a perfect bear off, he's also got the three point, which isn't isn't that much worse, it's a little bit worse. You know that you're in big trouble after he covers if you dance, or and certainly when he closes the board. So with four checkers off, you know that for sure you've got a big, big take. If with three checkers, it was a marginal take there. Joe, anything to add about this position? Yes, uh, actually, <laughs> Falafel and I were pretty convinced that this was a take. Uh, we we just thought there was enough scramble big. You know, the, the guy, when he doesn't close the three point or when he does and you come down the ace point, and we know the reference position of five men off, and we thought there's enough extra big to make this a take. I, my guess, I, I would have guessed this to be point nine, so, and, and Falafel also. So that can show that, you know, over the board, it's pretty tough to analyze these positions. We did have the reference position. We're leaning on knowing that if we had five men off, this is a bear take. But in this position, we have we don't have five men off. We're probably going to end up being closed out and only having three men off. But it, is it an, does enough of the time happen that we scramble forward? Does he not close that three point? Do we come in with an ace and escape? Does that happen enough that it pulls us up, you know, to a take? And we both we both misanalyze this position thinking that we probably did have a take. We were pretty convinced and we were wrong. Well, I'll make it a big take for you. At Move point this nine, nine, you both would have been right. So if you yeah. were wrong, you were both only wrong by a very, very small margin. So I think the basic thing we can take from this position is, is a very good reference position if you happen to ever achieve this position again or something yeah, and, like it. And what makes it a very good reference position also is let's put four checkers off instead of three. Now you've got a monster take. It's the one more checker is huge. Look at this. Not even a double. It's a, it, because it's a, it, it may even be a take after he after he makes the uh, after he makes the three point with four checkers off. I'm not sure about that. Let's see. Let's have blue make the make the point and you dance. Four checkers yeah, off. Be a yeah. Take. yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't even lose your market after the after the point is made. So that's it. Shows you what a monster difference it is. Well, you, having three checkers off versus four checkers off. You can also. You can also. Here's, here's another, another interesting, interesting point. You can. It could be instructive for people. for people. Steve, turn, turn your mute your your uh, Instructive point for people. If you want to see, how often do I win this game, when I'm not, you know, how often do I win this game without getting closed out? Well, you can see that it has. Red winning this game 22%. Now close him out and see how often he wins with four men off.
Okay, so now he wins like 17%. So you can say that like 5% of the time he was going to win that game by going forward, even when it was blue shake and he was on the roll against that best five-point board. Yeah, and by the way, you're never getting gammon. You've got checkers off, so there's no gammon risk. And this is another thing I learned in the Chouette from one of my mentors, Howard Ring. He said, if you're if you're ever in a situation, especially in a money game, and you're not quite sure if it's a take or not, if there's almost no gammons, if you've only got one checker back, or if there's no gammons at all, give it a shot. You're just not losing that much more to lose one point instead of two. And the other guy usually has the harder checker plays. There's no question that Blue has the chance of making all kinds of checker play errors here, and Red's not going to make any checker play errors. And this 17% is based on the fact that Blue's going to play perfectly, and we both know that very few hum- humans will play perfectly. Now, most jocks are going to play perfectly from here, but your average player is going to make a mistake or two in the bear off, and that that could get you a take right there. Just that could get you right up to your over 21%. Uh, Joe, Steve, I really appreciate two things. Number one, that you actually came to the shoe at that night, and uh, it was fun for my students. Uh, again, it wasn't like shooting fish in a barrel because all of my students there, I'm very proud to say, were at least strong intermediate, and some of them were open players. The uh, we, They were not required to take the box and take the risk, and some of them passed the box from time to time and could, although most didn't. We weren't playing for that much money. It was a lot of fun. We're going to do it again uh, before the L.A. tournament because it was so much fun. Uh, I recommend anybody in the country, if you've got more than eight players together, play an interlocking shoeette. It is the most fun you'll have with your pants on. Uh, it's And if you can get a chance to play with giants who are kind enough to explain why they're doing what they're doing and share their information as these guys do, uh, you're gonna you're gonna learn enough. It's uh, it's a lesson well well worth it, even if you lose a bunch. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, I will uh, share this video with the world, and uh, we'll do it again. And I'll see you in, in L.A. Uh, uh, I'll be there in June 2nd for the big tournament June that starts June 5th, and uh, I'll see you in the interlocking shoeette again. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for having us. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure to help. It's a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll see you soon.